so I want to welcome all of you. Uh, thank you for, for coming. There are, there are a lot of you in attendance, and for good reason. We have a lot of exciting stuff today. Uh, and we have a wonderful guest, uh, Ka Ping Yi. Um, and for those of you who uh, aren't familiar with our work, um, at the Center for Election Science, uh, we empower voters through voting methods that strengthen democracy. We look at all kinds of voting methods, and we have a number of events um, talking about these different types of voting methods and how to look at them. And one of the interesting uh, uh, parts here is that uh, sometimes uh, uh, voting methods can be a bit complicated, so we're lucky and fortunate enough here to have Ka Ping Ying with us, uh, who's going to talk about some of his work uh, about how uh, that's been able to uh, uh, clarify the way that we look at, at voting methods. And it's uh, a pleasure uh, as executive director for the Selection Science to be able to introduce uh, Ka Ping Yi. Uh, so I'll give, I'll give his introduction. So uh, Ka Ping Yi is a software engineer with a background in election systems from his graduate studies in computer security at UC Berkeley. While there, Ping happened to be in the right place at the right time to participate in a voting machine security review commissioned by the Secretary of State in California. The results of which led to the decertification of all voting machines without paper trails in California in 2007. Uh, since then, he's worked in humanitarian relief with Google and Doctors Without Borders, and more recently in progressive politics at Tech for Campaigns. So it is uh, my pleasure uh, to welcome Ka Ping Yi. So, hey. Thank you for uh, for joining us. And I, I uh, thanks so much, Aaron. Uh, but before the call, about how much of a personal fan I am as well of, of your work, I know uh, getting into this space and as uh, learning more and more about voting methods, sometimes it can be kind of complicated. And being able to have folks like you out there to be able to uh, be able to take some of these sometimes complicated ideas and be able to create visualizations with them to be able to kind of uh, give our working memory a little bit of a break in some cases to be able to think of the uh, kind of higher order thinking methods, and sometimes just to be able to understand what's going on to begin with. So, uh, so maybe to start, uh, we can talk a bit about your history working with uh, uh, election security. Um, so, uh, so we could talk about that and then go into some of the diagrams that you've uh, that you've developed. Uh, so how did you get into looking at election security and some of these voting machine issues? Um, yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, thanks for that really glowing introduction. <laughs> um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, and to see all your faces. Um, some of the names in this room actually I recognize and am excited to actually meet, not to meet you in person. Um, so it's, it's a it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, So I did my graduate school at UC Berkeley um, in computer science. Um, came out here from Canada um, and uh, initially was interested in um, system security and uh, human computer interaction. So sort of the intersection of um, usability of computer systems and security, um, which tends to be a problem area for, it's a very common problem area, you know, things that are um, highly secure, are often hard to use um, and things, you know, people often sacrifice security um, in the hope that it will make things easier to use. Uh, and so there's a real question about how to make things that are both usable and secure. Um, and as it turned out at the time uh, I was in graduate school, uh, there was a lot of controversy over um, the use of electronic voting machines um, here in the United States, um, particularly in California. And uh, a number of um, academics, uh, computer scientists and others um, had some pretty strong positions and, and really strong concerns about um, the reliability uh, and uh, potential vulnerability of um, voting machines. And that's, so that's sort of how I got into thinking about voting machines as a sort of offshoot of my, um, my security work. Uh, and then at the same, the same time, because I was really interested in usability um, and uh, information architecture, um, I also had a side interest in uh, information visualization. Uh, and so um, that led to some of my other work uh, you know, trying to make things more visible and understandable. Um, I always thought that, um, you know, there's a, there's a big gap between um, the information, the data we have, um, and how people are able to understand uh, what that means. 
Um, I, I saw with some of the work you, you mentioned focusing on making sure that voting machines had a paper trail. Uh, like a, a lot of times when we think about election security, some people look at ideas of uh, like internet voting or online voting, um, but then you have ideas like man in the middle attacks and, and other types of vulnerabilities. Uh, what, what were some of the issues that you were concerned with when you were say like looking at some of the voting machines in California uh, in terms of, of uh, issues that you wanted to make sure that uh, weren't present in actual elections? Um, so in that specific case, so there, there was, um, I should uh, maybe just to give a little bit of context. So the research that I was doing was about sort of end to end security that is like, you know, when you run a whole election, how do you actually know that the votes you've counted um, and the results you have from counting the votes are actually the votes that people cast. Um, and that was a little bit broader and ended up, you know, sending me in a certain direction. And it just so happened that during that time when I was doing that work, um, this political controversy was also happening. Uh, and so the Secretary of State of California um, at the time, Deborah Bowen, um, decided to, it, I think it was pretty unusual. I've, I've never actually heard of something like this happening before. She actually ordered the voting machine companies to hand over their source code. Um, you know, they're all proprietary systems um, and they, they all still are. That's one of the criticisms of them is that um, our, our voting systems run on software code that nobody can see or audit. Um, and so she actually ordered them to hand it over to the, to the um, Secretary of State's office. Um, and she commissioned uh, several um, computer science professors to um, investigate that source code. And it so happened that one of the professors she tapped was my advisor, um, David Wagner. And so he looped in me and some other graduate students to uh, sit in a windowless room <laughs> for a few weeks um, on the Berkeley campus with this super secret source code that you know we couldn't take out of the room. We just had to go in there and like, you know, page through it um, to uh, look for bugs and security vulnerabilities and write a report about it. Um, and that was actually really exciting. Uh, it was it was pretty cool to get to look at source code that, um, at least in theory, no one outside of those companies had seen before. Uh, and it was both uh, shocking and entertaining. <laughs> um to discover the volume of bugs and issues that we found when you say uh, shocking and entertaining uh, you mentioned some of the bugs but was, was there anything in particular that really came to mind in terms of like that you just really didn't expect or caught you off guard uh just i mean there were there are pretty pervasive problems throughout um so the you know the system we looked at uh we looked at source code um I'm just reading the, the questions in the chat here. So we looked at source code on computer screens, um, but uh, you know we um, had to you know write up a report on what we thought uh, might uh, you know might go wrong when these things were actually deployed. Um, and there are multiple systems involved, right? There are the there's the direct recording uh, electronic machines where you, you punch the buttons on the touch screen. Um, there are machines for scanning paper ballots. Um, there are machines for uh, taking all of that data and aggregating it. So um, in this case, they had a, a cartridge, a memory cartridge um, that you had in the machine. It would record the votes when you use the touch screen. And then they had to like put, put those things together and, and sum them up on a PC. Um, and then they had PC software for the election administrators to manage um, all of this data and tallied up. Um, and every single component of the system had pretty glaring security flaws. Um, for example, uh, one you know one that I just remember off the top of my head was that um, the uh, uh, the tallies um, that were added up on the on the PCs, right? The, the program that was for the for your desktop computer to add up the tallies um, was on a Windows local network, and everything was transmitted in the clear over the network, including the password. Uh, so if you were on the same network, you would just become the administrator and change all the election totals. Uh, <laughs> um, so you know, very very basic issues. Um, and then we also found some sort of more interesting issues that uh, maybe were a little more far-fetched, but were sort of interesting and in that, that they were possible and that it turned out uh, components uh, that were supposed to be uh, inert, basically, you know, just contain totals uh, for reasons we don't really understand. They decided to invent their own little interpreted language, um, which could run code on those memory cartridges. Um, 
which made it possible to infect the memory cartridges with the virus. Uh, so in, in theory, technically, it would have been possible to introduce a memory cart cartridge with a virus, um, you know, put it in a machine, have it infect that machine, and have it infect the next memory cartridge you put in the machine, and have it infect the other machines, and change the voting results. So, you know, there's there's a there's a fun <laughs> fun report you can read about this if you like, um, in which we go through a lot of these issues. Yeah, I, I think uh, one one question I think a, a lot of folks is in people's uh, minds is, of course, all of these issues were were, were fixed. Uh, it, uh, right? Is is that the uh, the the answer that you have for us? I, sorry, I was just replying, to, but just wanted to post a URL in the chat because people are asking where to find the report. So the URL I just posted is the URL of my page that has a bunch of different voting information on it, um, and the um, security review is one of the items in that page. Um, I'm I'm sorry, Aaron. Could you repeat the that question? So so you, you mentioned uh, being able to identify a number of security flaws within the uh, the, the voting machine uh, software. Um, so I think a lot of the uh, what's on people's minds at the moment, given given that statement, is like, of course, like all these issues were were fixed. Uh, is is that <laughs> is that is that correct? Uh, not at all. Um, I mean, we of course strongly recommended that they be fixed, and we actually made a bunch of uh, recommendations in our report. Um, the public version of the report, which you can see at the URL I posted, um, is only part of the report. So we wrote it in two sections, where we sort of documented as many of the issues as we could in a public fashion, and then took all of the really sensitive information, like the actual passwords we found or the actual vulnerabilities and you know how you might exploit them and put all that in a private appendix, which you did not see, um, including some recommendations for you know how to fix these things. And we have no way of knowing that those recommendations were followed. Um, we did not you know, get to review the machines again. Um, the conclusion the Secretary of State reached was simply that it was not uh, it was not a good idea to rely on the correctness of the software. Um, and so that I, I guess I just want to highlight like one of the principles that um, most of the computer security experts in the in the field of voting will um, refer to. I, I think it's the most important principle um, with respect to voting um, is the principle of software independence that. Any system you design that's going to be processing votes with software has to have some mechanism for recovering from errors in that software, um, such that you know you can show that the result is independent of the software failing. Uh, and so, the um, uh, Secretary of State concluded that uh, the only way to really be sure was to record everything on paper. Uh, and so, now in California, we record all of our. I mean, we still count them with machines, but we record the votes on paper. Um, in, uh, in, in looking at this, uh, uh, have you learned anything else about other states in terms of uh, like how they do things or, well, I, I guess like within voting machines, there are only a few companies that like uh, have, that they use voting machine stuff at the US. Um, so like, do you suspect like that these issues are more prevalent really that uh, so, so do you think like California is an outlier here in terms of these issues uh, with uh, with what you've seen here, or uh, given how voting machines are utilized through these handful of companies throughout the U.S., like do you see this as perhaps a more pervasive issue? Uh, I so I think the the issue of flaws and potential vulnerabilities is pervasive. Um, there, there really aren't there are no real significant incentives. Um, for the companies who make these machines to really um, harden them or even audit them for security. Uh, you know, they're, they're private companies. They just sell these machines to uh, election officials and make claims. And the election officials usually, you know, they're stuck with the same machine that they used for several years because they have a lot of processes developed around it. They don't want to retrain people. You know, getting a new system would be a lot of work. Um, and so often they use machines that are really old. Uh, often they don't even have funding to, to buy new machines. So, you know, the, the incentives are really, really messed up. Um, so, you know, California, I think at least in 2007 was ahead of the game in the sense that, um, you know, Secretary of State was actually like fairly technically uh, aware, um, which, you know, as you know, is not something you can say of all politicians. So we were really lucky with Deborah Bowen. Um, and she, you know, understood what source code was and what the what the importance of it was. You know, why it was significant to have it audited. 
Um, that's already like a few steps ahead of the game, I think. Uh, so, you know, in, in many other states, uh, there are still, it, it's still totally um, normal practice to record votes with no paper trail. Um, so like there, there are other organizations out there like Verified Voting uh, and yeah. other academics like Matt Blaze who uh, look at uh, these types of election security issues. Yeah. Uh, G given your experience with California, if you could just say like uh, a particular policy uh, that would be nice to be implemented, uh, that would really address a lot of these problems. Like what kind of policy, like if you could just kind of wave a wand and then yeah. the policy here, what kind yeah, of policy? Yeah. And there's, there's, I mean, fortunately in a way, or I guess the, the good news is that um, there is a pretty simple, like a pretty straightforward recommendation um, to address these problems that almost that pretty much everybody agrees on. It's not like it's, there's a lot of controversy in terms of like in the academic professional space. Um, yeah, Matt Blaze was actually, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of his too. He and I worked together and he was one of the um, uh, investigators on the um, source code review in California. Uh, but um, here's, here's the thing to remember if you're you know lobbying for a policy, for example, or talking to an election official, there's two things that you need. The first, is you have to have a durable paper record of the votes, um, whether that's the actual ballot that was marked by the voter or a printout that was verified. You know, the voter actually looked over the printout and confirmed those are their correct votes. There has to be some kind of physical record of the vote um, that uh, is is managed, you know, with a, with a, a physical chain of security from where it is created to where it is stored. And the second thing is that you need to establish software independence by auditing the results of the election according to that physical record. And um, there's a, a, a paper on this um, came out, I, I think it was like maybe 08 or so, um, about how to do what's called a risk limiting audit. So you have this question, right? You, so you have you know, 100,000 ballots or something like that. Okay, now how do you decide how you're gonna audit? Are you gonna, you gonna recount them all by hand? I mean, it's really expensive. So um, what you do is you establish a, a maximum probability of error that you're willing to accept. Let's say, you know, I wanna be 99% certain that the outcome of the election that I got when I counted the votes was the correct outcome. And so you can work backwards from that using that um, probability of error, that limit, and your knowledge of what the margin of victory was in the election to determine how many ballots you need to sample and audit. So if the margin of victory is very large, right, then you only need to sample a few ballots to confirm that like, okay, the person you selected as the winner is probably the winner because there would have to be a lot of errors in order to reverse that victory. Um, on the other hand, if the margin of victory is really small, if it's close, um, then you need to sample more ballots. And so you can calculate how many ballots you need to sample and then randomly sample them, you know, audit them against the actual uh, counted results. Um, and that gives you some, you know, actually like quantifiable assurance uh, that you got a, a, the correct result in the election. Cool. And, and so, we're actually seeing that come into play in some places like uh, Colorado, for example, I think they were one of the pioneers there. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. So the, the, the most important and successful things, uh, policy changes, I would, I would say, uh, in some are uh, paper trails and risk limiting audits. Uh, before we uh, go and transition into the uh, uh, diagrams. Uh, is there anything else that you want to highlight with uh, some of the election security issues? Uh, and also uh, related a little bit to our audience, are, are there elements of that that you see being a bit different uh, when you're talking about different types of voting methods or different types of data, whether it be ordinal data or cardinal data and how those things change? Yeah, yeah. I was noticing in the chat, um, Rob Lanfear, if I've pronounced your name correctly. Hi. Um, yeah, um, really glad you brought up that point about summability. Uh, so, you know, exactly. If you if you can sum, if your your election method is summable, um, then you can actually do smaller audits that you know give you useful results because you know that you can sum the results in individual pre precincts. If your land fear, okay, great. <laughs> um, if uh, if your voting method is not summable, then you can't determine the outcome of the election without collecting all of the ballots in the entire election. Um, and so that makes it much harder for you to do uh, a useful audit. 
and and uh, in terms of precinct summability, um, I I think the uh, voting method that comes to everyone's mind in terms of like not uh, meeting that particular criterion is instant runoff voting or, or ranked choice voting. Yeah, um, I'm of the opinion for a variety of reasons, including um, the diagrams that, that we're kind of about to talk about, but also also other reasons. Um, I I feel quite alarmed and concerned about the um, uh, uh, popularity of um, instant runoff, or as they call it, ranked choice voting, that seems to be taking hold in a lot of places in the United States. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's concerning for many reasons, including the lack of some ability. And I, I feel your pain too with the, the the naming the the idea that they would take an entire class of voting methods. Yeah. Uh, but we're we'll with it. Uh, so uh, transitioning into the diagrams that you created, so you've got. Um, uh, from your your website, there are really two that that stand out here. One, um, which I think a lot, a lot of people think of with the E diagrams, are two dimensional. Uh, but there's another one that uh, uh, looks at um, uh, political ideology and frequency of of, of votes, uh, where you can move the distribution. I think that one is maybe a little bit simpler, uh, where you look at ideology on like a one dimensional plane versus a two dimensional plane, uh, and so perhaps. Uh, uh, we could talk about the the one with fewer dimensions first, and then we can go up to two dimensions. Uh, so, you have the um, uh, the boat simulation tool. Perhaps we could talk about that first, and I'll yeah, give you sure. a moment to, to to share your screen if you like. Yeah, uh, let me share this window and see if is that visible to Perfect. everybody. That's it. I'll try and just arrange that so that you can. Uh, so it scales yeah. well for the for the screen aspect ratio. Um, so, so what what are we uh, what are we looking at here? Okay, so first of all, I just want to say this this page has existed for a while, and if any of you have gone to it and found it to be broken, uh, that I, I apologize. It this was actually written way back in the dark ages when people wrote things in Flash. <laughs> um, so this is a this is a Flash um, animation, and um, I only just discovered this morning that there are uh, the new world of WebAssembly, people have written a uh, Flash simulator um, that you can use to make Flash animations work again um, after uh, Adobe deprecated it and turned it off uh, last year. So this is back to being working uh, again. Um, and what we're looking at is um, an extremely simplified, idealized um, political map in which everybody has one, uh, everybody's opinion is expressed as a point on a one dimensional spectrum, just a left to right, you know, all the way left or all the way right or somewhere in the middle. Um, and we know that doesn't actually fully represent the way people actually vote, but uh, it's, a, it's a nice visualization to at least help people understand how um, we're doing these simulations. Um, and then we make an assumption about how people are distributed and imagine that uh, they're distributed along a bell curve on that spectrum. Um, and then we imagine we have some number of candidates whose positions are also indicated, uh, described using a single dimension. Um, so this represents the red candidate, and this is uh, the red candidate's position. Um, this is the green candidate and the green candidate's position. And the shading you see up here um, is imagining what would happen if each voter voted for the candidate that was closest to their position. Um, so everybody on this side, uh, all, all these voters vote for the red candidate. And all these voters vote for the green candidate, um, and you know this dividing point is exactly halfway between them. So what's going on here is, um, given this distribution, so the way it looks right now, um, you can see that the green candidate would win because roughly three quarters of the voters would vote for vote for him. Uh, so that's this part, the the green sure. shaded part of this bell curve, as compared mm -hmm. to the red shaded part. And you can also see that correct by clicking on the uh, particular voting method. That's right. Yeah. So, th so this is a description of how people will vote. And then underneath it, each of these bars uh, shows a particular voting method and then what the outcome of the election would be, where the position along the bar is the center of the distribution. So the fact that this is green over here means that in a plurality election, if this center of the distribution is over here in the green region, then the green candidate will win. 
and if it's over here, the red candidate will win. So this is this is pretty intuitive for I mean if for just a two candidate election, um, all the all the methods behave the same, uh, you know just depending upon whether the center of gravity of the electorate is closer to the red candidate or the green candidate. Um, but once you introduce more candidates, then it gets more interesting. So um, I'm going to add another candidate over here. These are our favorite elections. Can, uh, elections with two candidates are so boring. We don't want to see those. Yeah, they're also really problematic <laughs> um, to have only two parties. But that's yeah, that's another serious problem our system has. Uh, okay, so I'm going to add this yellow candidate and turn them on. And so now you see that the behavior is a little bit different depending on the system. Uh, so again, each each voter is voting for the candidate that's closest to them. So now there's a segment of voters over here that votes for the yellow candidate. Um, and as you're probably familiar, uh, if the um, candidates on the sides uh, can um, take can steal away enough of the distribution, they squeeze out the candidate in the middle, even though maybe the candidate in the middle might be acceptable to more people. Um, and you can see that this problem is worst um, in plurality elections. Uh, you can see you can see here that the width of the green bar is uh, narrower or wider depending on the particular voting method that's being used, even though um, they're all seeing the same election. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, so in this particular example, I've just set up here, right, where the center of gravity is located, right about here, where the circle is. Um, the uh, red candidate is winning even though the green candidate actually is closer to the center opinion. Um, and that's because uh, the green and yellow candidates have split the vote on their side. Um, when I, this, is, this is interesting too, because I think like a lot of times when people think about vote splitting, they think like, oh, like there's that fringe candidate coming out of nowhere, coming from the extreme left or the extreme right. But here, like you're not, you're not seeing that. Like here you're seeing uh, a squeeze from the, uh, from the middle. Yes, yeah, it can happen in either situation. Um, it's, you know, plurality is particularly sensitive to it. And we, so we run into this problem a lot um, in our current system. Uh, and it can even be the case that uh, you can set up a distribution where, I just squeeze this in here, the green candidate actually has no chance of winning it whatsoever, even though uh, they're in the middle. Um, approval and Condorcet voting uh, have the same behavior, which is that the, um, you actually get the behavior you might expect, which is that the candidate who's closest to the center of opinion wins. Um, the board account, um, which maybe most of you are familiar with, I, I'm guessing, where candidates get points based on how they're ranked. Do, do I need to explain this, Aaron, or do you think folks know? Um, it's, it's helpful to maybe give uh, like a, sure. a, a, a quick one. It, it's quicker yeah. to explain than instant runoff voting, at least. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. Most things are. <laughs> Um, so the board account is a method of uh, counting votes in which um, each voter ranks the candidates. Let's say I rank them, you know, one, two, three. Um, and the candidate with the lowest average ranking or lowest total ranking, depending on, depending on what you require people to fill in on their ballots, um, wins. Uh, and that method actually favors the centrist. So it actually gives the centrist even more of an advantage, um, the opposite of what happens in plurality. Yeah, now, someone, someone else is uh, pointing out uh, a funny thing that seems to be occurring here with instant runoff voting. Uh, that is, as you move uh, uh, closer to a candidate, it seems like it's hurting that candidate. And when you move further away from a candidate, it seems to be helping that candidate in some instances. So you, you see this kind of like going back and forth in terms of who wins within the bar on instant runoff voting that looks kind of funny there. Yeah, so th this is really strange. I mean, this, I mean, I would call this like pretty messed up <laughs> um, in that, uh, you know, if you're, let's say here, for example, let's say this represents the public opinion, you know, two weeks before the election and you support the green candidate. So you campaign for the green candidate and shift public opinion toward the green candidate um, that can actually cause them to lose. Uh, and that's the non-monotonic uh, behavior of instant runoff voting um, that's, that's often criticized, uh, that um, people can actually hurt their favorite candidate um, by ranking them higher. 
Um, so one of the other comments I've seen, and I recall that your simulation tool allowed for it, which is, um, so when, when I've looked at uh, studies that have asked the question like, okay, well, what does the distribution of voters look like in terms of their political ideology? Um, even when you add other dimensions, like it's, it, it follows a normal type of distribution. But for our sake of, of argument, uh, what happens when we change the distribution uh, from normal distribution to say like a uniform distribution or a bimodal distribution? Oh yeah, a bunch of uh, a bunch of things happen. So I, I just added a fourth candidate here just to make this, just to show how messy this is, but let's- uh, The colors just, are- Just for a second, so it doesn't get too confusing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I can change the distribution. This is, this is a bimodal distribution, what this looks like with two humps. Um, and you can also ask for a uniform distribution. Uh, and in this uniform distribution model, you still get um, this non-monotonic behavior in instant runoff. It's actually even a little bit worse. Uh, you know, the green candidate has very little chance of winning, um, despite being, you know, probably the best candidate to to uh, satisfy the needs of most of the voters, um, and has these tiny little regions that are way off on either side. Yeah. And. One of the questions that we're seeing from from uh, Joel is asking about the different voting methods uh, in terms of which ones can exhibit this non-monotonic behavior um, versus others. And as we can, I mean, see right here, the only one where we see this kind of back and forth pattern uh, is showing up with the uh, with instant runoff voting. So yeah, um, but, so you instant can you... runoff is is the only voting system that anyone ever really talks about that. Um, has this property. It's it's kind of amazing that it it qualifies. <laughs> um, uh, interestingly, uh, although this isn't uh, on there, a um, uh, traditional runoff would also have this uh, property as well as being uh, non-monotonic in certain situations. Oh, I guess that's true. Yeah, that's true. And that is that is a system that people use. Uh, any other uh, 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 requests in terms of uh, uh, fun pictures that we can look at? Any other like uh, uh, back and forth uh, uh, color scheme that we can see under instant runoff voting from this one? Uh, just that as you introduce more candidates, it just gets more complicated, and the candidates in the middle generally lose out. So here, you know, the yellow candidate has no chance of winning at all, um, and you can even create situations where. Uh, here we go, where, you know, the um, the outcome of the election just kind of changes all over the place and it's not even really sensible. Um, this, you know, I, I consider this disqualifying and that like it doesn't, it just doesn't really make sense to have an election system that reflects public opinion in this way. Um, there's, there's no intuitive reason why, uh, uh, why this should happen. Uh, maybe to give, uh... IRV a little bit of, of credit because like uh, we we do criticize it quite a little uh, quite a lot uh, mm -hmm. uh, in in our work as well. Um, would it be possible to see maybe for simplicity just three candidates um, and look at a maybe a typical uh, vote splitting uh, scenario that we might see where um, there's like a someone like close to the person on the left or or on the right? Oh yeah, right. Okay, so. Um, right, so in a situation like this, for example, uh, red and green are splitting the vote on the left, mm -hmm. um, and that gives an advantage to yellow on the right. Yeah, so, so here, like, I, I think this is, like, normally when I think about where we can kind of throw instant runoff voting a bone, uh, tends to be in this type of scenario where we see a third party or independent who really doesn't have very much support. And here, throwing it about only with regard to winner selection, not actually how it captures information for the, the candidates themselves, but just in terms of choosing uh, the, the winner. Uh, it, it seems like when a candidate doesn't have very much support, it seems to address this, uh, address that kind of problem uh, really uh, well. Um, but as we saw a moment ago, whenever that candidate becomes more competitive uh, with the other two candidates, uh, you can just kind of throw all that out the window and you start to see these other types of, of oddities such as that center squeeze effect where you can hover the distribution right over that candidate in the middle and they still don't win or 
uh, some non-monotonicity where uh, you can actually have a candidate get more votes and wind up losing. Yeah, um, I, I guess I just want to call out a, a couple things about the simulation here. So, one you know, there's one of the idealistic assumptions is that the voters have complete information about the candidates and they're just voting for the best one, as if you know every voter was perfectly rational, and uh, it doesn't. There's no way to express in the simulation that some candidates might just be better at campaigning than other candidates, or just might be more, you know, have more name recognition, for example. And so the idea of major and minor candidates doesn't really show up in the simulation as well as it could. Um, although this is probably about as close to an illustration of, of the effect that Aaron is talking about that, um, that you could have. Um, the thing I, I guess I want to point out is that, you know, again, approval on Condorcet split the difference exactly in the middle as they as one imagines that you would or you would want them to. Um, and in the plurality first past the vote, uh, first past the post system, um, the L candidate has the biggest advantage. So IRV reduces their unfair advantage, but it doesn't eliminate it. Is there anything uh, that you'd like to point out here or any questions about this particular uh, simulation tool before we add another dimension to the mix? Uh, I don't have anything else, I think, although I see a, a number of comments going by. Um, is there? Uh, yeah, if you, if, I guess, Aaron, I'll, I'll leave it to you as, as moderator and person who is keeping track of the time. Sure. If, if you see anything that. Um, so there, there's one uh, question about the types of inputs within the model. Uh, so what you can see here on the top left hand of the screen is the type of ordinal uh, inputs or, or, or grades um, uh, from uh, that is assumed given the distribution layout of the uh, of the of the voter distribution that you can kind of manipulate back and forth there. So it's using that information to infer all of the ordinal rankings. That's right. Yeah. So it's making it's making again the assumption that voters will rank the candidates in order of closest to their opinion to the furthest away. Cool. cool. Well, maybe we can uh, uh, start to look more in a, a second dimension in terms of political ideology and see what this looks like in two dimensions. Yeah. So, um, so in these visualizations, we're doing exactly the same kind of simulation. Uh, we're even assuming a similar distribution. It's a it's a normal. Uh, distribution of bell curve like this. Um, but there are two degrees of freedom um, on which voters and candidates can differ. Um, and so there's a lot of text here just describing <laughs> um, how these were run. Um, so opinion is represented by a point on a plane. And then the way that the simulations are run, uh, we just scatter uh, hundreds of thousands of voters at random according to that bell curve distribution. Actually, you know, count the election and see what happens. Um, and then we color the point at that spot, uh, just like along this bar, we would color the point along the bar. So now we can color in the entire plane. Uh, and so here's a simple example where you've got three candidates and the candidates are arranged at the corners of an equilateral triangle. They're equidistant in the plane. Um, and you and color all the points in the plane then. Maybe, uh, and I realize this is perhaps a bit uh, late, but perhaps like we can quickly uh, go over each of the uh, five methods that are being described here. Better, oh, better, sure, late, yeah. than, better late than never. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, yeah, I'm assuming a certain... Uh, a, a lot of people in this uh, in this audience are going to know, but just the, yeah. if we, if we get some newcomers too, we want to be fair to them. Great, yeah. So, okay, so we're comparing five different um, ways of determining the single winner of an election. Um, and in, in this particular setup with the candidates in this position, they all look the same, but um, so the, the methods are a plurality election in which everybody gets to vote for just one candidate, and then the winner is the candidate who get, gets the most votes. Um, approval, in which everybody can approve or disapprove of all the candidates. So you can think of that as voting for any as many as you want, um, or you can also think of that as uh, giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to every candidate. Uh, and the way that's run in the simulation here is that um, there's a radius within which uh, a candidate is considered acceptable and the voter votes for the candidates that they, they find acceptable. Um, the board account I described earlier, uh, you rank the candidates. Um, in this case, you rank them based on how far away uh, they are from the voter. Uh, and they get more points um, if they are uh, higher in the ranking. They get, uh, for example, they get uh, 
you, you, could, you could call it. Like they get one point for being ranked third, two points for being ranked second, three points for being ranked first, and then the candidate with the most points wins. Um, Condorcet is actually a family of voting methods. It's not a, it's not a single method, but it's, it's a property um, that a certain class of voting methods has. And that property is uh, that if every voter ranks the candidates in the order of their preference, the winner of the Condorcet election is also the winner of every head-to-head -head match. Uh, if you were to compare you know, every possible pairing of two candidates, A versus B, B versus C, C versus A, and you compared who ranked A high, higher than B versus who ranked B higher than A, and that determines who wins that matchup. You do the same thing with every possible pair of matchups. The Condorcet winner, you know, for example, if it's A, uh, the winner would be A if A beats B in that one-on-one -on -one matchup and also A beats C in the one-on-one -on -one matchup. So it's absolutely clear that A has to be the winner because you know, if in, in comparison to any of the other uh, candidates, um, they're considered superior by the voters. And then finally, the, the fifth diagram here, um, I call this the hair method. It goes by several different names. So in the United States, it goes by instant runoff voting or uh, currently marketed as ranked choice voting um, in which uh, each voter ranks the candidates. Again, um, we're assuming the same input. So they're ranking the candidates based on um, the, uh, how far away they are. So the candidates that are closest to the voters are ranked first, furthest away are, are ranked last. And then the way you combine all these rankings is you do this complicated procedure where you look at all of the ballots and you put them in piles based, first of all, you just ignore everything except the top rank on each ballot. So who's, who's ranked first? So you put the ballots in piles based on who's ranked first, you count them up. And then if any pile has more than half the ballots in it, that's the winner. And if not, you take the smallest pile and you go through all the ballots in that pile and you cross off the top ranked candidate. And then you consider the next ranked candidate on that ballot and move it to that pile. Um, then you repeat the procedure. You look at the piles you have. If any pile is now more than half the ballots, that's the winner. Otherwise, you find the smallest pile and then eliminate uh, the top visible rank, not yet crossed off rank on those ballots by crossing it off and then looking at the next one and moving the ballot to that, that pile. So there's a sort of gradual consolidation of the ballots um, until there's a pile that uh, constitutes a majority. I do have a, a, a question about uh, Condorcet here. So uh, I, when we look at uh, ideology or issues or degrees of freedom in terms of just one, um, you can't have, in, in that case, there's always a Condorcet winner. Um, but when you have more than two issues or, or, or dimensions, now you can have your uh, Condorcet paradox where there isn't necessarily someone who can beat everyone head to head. Uh, okay. So here, uh, so in the first one, we can expect that there's always going to be a Condorcet winner when there's only uh, one dimension of we're moving the distribution back and forth. But here we have two dimensions, uh, an x-axis and a y-axis here. Uh, and so uh, here, uh, how do you, what, uh, what tiebreaker, or you, you mentioned that the Condorcet method is a family of systems. Is there a particular tiebreaker uh, that you use when there wasn't a Condorcet winner here? So uh, as it turns out, okay, so if you allow voters to rank the candidates arbitrarily, then you can end up in a situation where there is no Condorcet winner. But if you, in this particular limited case where you're on a two-dimensional plane and you're using Euclidean distance, um, you always have a Condorcet winner because that there's no that the that there's always a, a possible ordering, just because of the flatness of the space. It's possible to mathematically prove this, but it may be a little bit long, a little bit much to go into um, here. It's just because of this the limited um, the the simplifications involved in, in doing the simulation um, that uh, make the possibility of a non of having no Condorcet winner uh, go away. And even in this scenario, you're saying? With yeah, and actually, and yeah, oh, David has made a good point here. Um, that's true just because I'm using a Gaussian distribution. Um, and depending, you know, if I used a different distribution, then uh, a, a cycle might actually appear. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and I, I think you're just kind of exemplifying like another uh, rationale for like when we look at things, different, uh, look at these voting methods under 
different lenses, it gives us different types of insight in terms of what their behavior is. Yeah, and I guess I, I should, I want to step back and just say for a moment, like how it came to me that, you know, this would be a good, a good thing to try. It's that, you know, I'd seen all of these debates on the internet about all the different voting systems and people, you know, arguing in favor of instant runoff or arguing in favor of approval. Um, and, you know, every, every team, so to speak, you know, team Condorcet would have like their examples of like particular elections with specific uh, voting counts, you know, specific inputs that would produce interesting or better or worse results. And team approval would have, you know, their examples and team instant runoff would have their examples. And so, you know, there'd be a lot of debate about like, okay, well, you know, sure, you contrived that example in which this weird behavior happened. But surely that never happens in practice, or you know that like almost never happens, or that always happens. And so then you sort of get into a debate about um, whose examples are more realistic. Uh, and so, you know, that made it kind of hard for me to grasp um, what actually makes a method better, or not only better in a particular situation, but like how is it better behaved um, under change, right? If opinion shifts in a certain direction, you move a little bit, you perturb the vote. Um, or you campaign for somebody, you know, what effect does that have? And it's hard to imagine what that is when you just look at a set of numbers. Uh, and so I really wanted to get a more holistic view of like, okay, well, what's the sort of behavior on a larger scale of the system? Um, and that's what led me to uh, make these diagrams. So is that part of identifying like, well, when you're trying to analyze something it's very challenging to do so unless you have a common kind of metric or, or playing field where they all abide by the same rules and are all in the same scenario to compare them. Is, is that kind of what you're, you're getting at? Uh, that's part of what I'm getting at. Um, I think it is a valid criticism of these simulations that uh, the space of possible elections that we're visualizing here you know, is a limited set. It, it makes a bunch of assumptions that don't necessarily hold in reality. Um, and so, I see this as helping you get an intuitive feel for how these systems behave. Um, and it's much easier to get that feeling uh, by looking at a visualization of, of data that's shown all together and its relationships shown than by looking at individual point examples. Um, sort of the difference between you know, looking at a bar graph and looking at a table of numbers, right? So you can look at the table of numbers, but that you have to sort of do a lot of mental work to see that there might be a trend, for example. Um, but when you plot it on a bar graph, the trend is much more visible. And so this is a way of uh, trying to collect a lot of examples to give you a feel for uh, uh, the system as, as a whole. Well, uh, maybe you can uh, show off some of these uh, examples. Yeah, right. OK, so things get a lot more interesting um, when we don't have the candidates arranged in this very nice balanced fashion. Um, so here I try to set up where the blue and green candidates are really close together um, and they split the vote as, as we were uh, similar to the example we were looking at in the one dimensional case. Um, and as you might expect um, in plurality voting, the middle candidate is squeezed out and has there's no actual uh, way for them to win in this situation. Um, and uh, the same thing actually happens in instant runoff. Uh, and the other systems um, provide the blue candidate with a chance to win. So the two-dimensional analog of a fair boundary exactly halfway between two candidates, which we saw in the one-dimensional case, um, is the perpendicular bisector uh, between those two points. And you can see actually, uh, it's, it's actually possible to mathematically prove that this boundary here between the red and blue candidates actually is exactly uh, the perpendicular bisector between these two dots. Um, and the same is actually true of Condorcet. These, these lines are actually in the same place. Um, and the, the fuzziness that you see here is just an artifact of the fact that I've, I did these simulations um, by randomizing the locations of the voters. Um, the same effect we talked about with Borda is also visible here. Uh, so the center candidate blue has a larger win region, right? You can actually see this is actually biased quite a bit. Uh, you know, it gives a lot more of this region to blue than to red. Um, and that is in keeping with um, the way a Borda uh, gives an advantage to centrist candidates. Yeah, we, I think with the previous uh, tool, uh, we saw that same kind of effect where the opportunity or the width of the uh, middle candidate was wider compared to the other voting methods. That's right, yeah. 
Um, so then I just tried a bunch of different examples here uh, and you got some interesting and strange shapes. So uh, in, in a two-dimensional <clears throat> scenario, the what non-monotonicity looks like is non-convexity um, in this case. So the region, uh, the win region for the green, uh, the green candidate is non-convex, which means that it, like, it has these gaps in it so that um, certain paths traveling across the two-dimensional plane um, will cause you to enter and then exit and then enter and then exit um, the region in which the green candidate wins. Um, and this is the, see, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say that the the boundary between blue and red actually this is this is sort of the correct boundary and it's halfway between blue and red, uh, but then the green candidate gets involved here and it, it, it's it just sort of messes things up. And and here this is the uh, vote splitting um, scenario where you have a candidate that's kind of on the edge that is touching near one of the other candidates. Is that correct? Um, so I mean that's also the vote is getting split by these two candidates. Although the previous diagram was the one that was intended to illustrate vote splitting in which the blue candidate has no chance. Okay. Um, and then this one is, was intended to illustrate um, the non-monotonic behavior okay. of instant runoff. Yeah. Right so I, this convex region. So I, I guess like with that as um, you're moving um, towards a candidate so like you can imagine being on like the bottom right or, or even like the, uh, I think maybe the, the bottom left of the uh, of the candidate there and moving yeah. towards the candidate and seeing like the, the voting center uh, center uh, get closer to that candidate. And yet it's really killing that, that candidate's odds of winning, even though that's right. more, more, uh, more voters are actually voting for that candidate. That's, that's right. That's exactly right. So, I mean, you could imagine in a, you know, fictional universe in which people actually were running an election like this and you were a green supporter, it would actually be strategically the correct thing for you to do to try and push public opinion into this weird corner over here um, and not actually campaign for your candidate, which seems ridiculous. Uh, there's some other examples here of different things I tried. So here's a more extreme example of a, a non-monotonic situation. Um, and when you add more candidates, things just kind of get more complicated. So we have four candidates, even when the four candidates are uniformly arranged, um, you already have some really weird behavior. It looks uh, like a coin scope. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just, you know, it becomes highly unpredictable um, what you're gonna get. Uh, and, you know, bears very little relationship to what you would want, I think, uh, if you wanted to actually represent the will of the voters. Uh, and, uh, you know, more ridiculous things happen if you, if you play with it. So um, something I've wanted to do for a long time, uh, but I've never actually gotten around to, <laughs> Um, was to make an interactive version of this where you can move the dots around just like you can move around the candidates in the one-dimensional version. Um, back in the day, uh, computers weren't fast enough to run the simulation in real time while you're moving dots around, but I bet you could do it today and I bet they would be fast enough. There's just, yeah, so there's just lots of weird things that can happen. Um, and so this really kind of cemented it for me that um, you know, instant runoff as a method is, it's not just sort of imperfect in the sense that it's like almost good enough. It just has some fundamental flaws in its behavior uh, that don't make sense and, you know, can't be easily corrected. And, and you mentioned um, uh, computers nowadays likely being able to um, perform some of these simulations in, in uh, real time. So it's probably worth a, a hat tip to uh, Nikki Case, who has yes. developed a lot of these types of sandbox tools through, by the way, as uh, as Nikki points out, uh, through inspiration uh, derived from from you. So you were uh, one of uh, Nikki's inspirers. We can show that off. Uh, Nikki Case does these amazing interactive visualizations um, that explain concepts uh, in a lovely way. And it's done, done a little bit more. Did one of them. Here we go. Yep. There it is. On voting systems. Um, let's see. Yeah. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you can see oh, yeah. uh, a shout out to copying me as well. Oh, <laughs> right. There it is. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I just wanted to show that here. Here we go. So this is this is the interactive visualization that uh, Nikki made. 
where you can actually just move around the candidates. Oh, they don't turn into smiley faces when they win. That seems very unlike Nikki. <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, so I think that's what I have to say about um, these visualizations. Uh, I have learned in the intervening years that um, people have talked about these and used them and even uh, named them after me, which uh, uh, feels like uh, kind of surprising and flattering. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm very happy that um, it's of interest to folks and uh, to the extent that it's helping people understand how these things work. Um, I think that's good. Excellent. Um, and uh, for uh, those in the uh, chat, if you want to leave questions in the chat, I can go ahead and look out for those. Um, so, uh, one person uh, SAS asks about other different types of, of voting methods. Um, so uh, for instance, there are, there are a number of cardinal methods that are uh, often uh, being uh, invented. How do you see, like how would you imagine some of these uh, playing out? Um, so I, I, I guess like as an example, uh, would you see like other cardinal methods such as like score voting or um, throw voting or three, two, one. Uh, uh, would you see those like looking a lot like how um, approval voting and board account and Condorcet look on here? Or like, would you imagine them looking a little bit differently? Um, I think so. Those are really interesting systems that um, I wasn't familiar with at the time that I um, made the simulation. Uh um, and so it would be really interesting to see how they fare. Uh, one of the things that makes that um, a more interesting problem to simulate is that some of the systems like score voting give you more degrees of freedom than uh, are really accounted for in the simulation, right? So al already, um, for example, the assumption that I made about ranking the candidates in the order of how far away they are from the voter, that eliminates the possibility of, um, it eliminates a degree of freedom that would have made it possible to rank them in a cycle for, for there to be a non, uh, for there to be no Condorcet winner. Um, and in score voting, you can assign every candidate a score. So now you need to come up with some assumption for how voters will score the candidates in your simulations, you know, choose some algorithm. Um, and so you would see different results depending upon which algorithm you chose. Um, I expect, though, under most, I mean, this is just a guess, but I, I think that if the distributions were normal and the scores that voters gave um, were uh, linear in Euclidean distance, um, or perhaps even, yeah, perhaps it would probably, probably even happen for like, uh, you know, distance squared or something like that, just a, if it were a monotonic curve decreasing, um, you'd probably see the same results as approval. In, in the sense that, you you know, the, the dividing line between two candidates would probably be halfway between the candidates. Uh, one, uh, uh, Chris Hubbard uh, asks about some of the uh, peculiar boundaries uh, that you see in incident runoff voting, uh, some that aren't uh, perpendicular bisectors. Uh, do you have an explanation for like why uh, some like you're seeing like some of these behaviors that like are even perpendicular bisectors uh, that are being demonstrated under incident runoff voting? Uh, I don't really. Um, I think there's yeah, there's some interesting math that could be done there uh, to figure out you know analytically what those boundaries are. Um, I have not done that math. <laughs> Um, often, I mean, a lot of the segments of those boundaries are perpendicular bisectors. Um, you know, some of them are, uh, but they might be per perpendicular bisectors between different pairs of candidates. Uh, so for example, this, this line here, you know, bisects green and red. Um, I'm not sure about this line here. It's, yeah, I don't have really an intuitive guess for, for where that came from. Um, so. And I see uh, uh, 
Malulani has a question about um, whether this would work with cumulative voting. And, it's, and as like a brief recap, uh, these simulation tools are being used for single winner methods, whereas cumulative voting is a multi-winner method where you can stack uh, multiple votes on a particular candidate. But kind of stretching that question a little bit, can you imagine using other types of visualization tools to be able to uh, look at multi-winner methods, uh, whether they be uh, block type systems or systems that have that are geared more towards proportional outcomes? Because um, that's, that, I think you got an open space there. If that's a, yeah, that would be a, super a cool. That, that sounds like a really <laughs> like tricky and challenging and really interesting design problem, um, both in terms of how to design the simulation so that it uh, is realistic enough to be useful, that it you know actually represents something that, that will will give you useful information, um, and then also how to design the visualization and the user experience so that you understand. Um, what it means, what the outcome means. Um, oh, I just saw a comment from Keith Edmonds saying he made a similar multi-winner system. Is, is this a visualization that Keith is talking about? If there is, I'd love to see it. It'd be really cool. Uh, I'll, I'll try and take a couple of these. So just, just quickly. So David asked, do I have a rationale for the log normal threshold that simulator voters, simulated voters use that, that distance threshold? Um, that was basically arbitrary. Um, there isn't a, an objective reason for that. Uh, okay, cool. Keith has sent a link to his code, um, which I'll be excited to check out. Uh, I noticed a couple of comments about um, Arrow's theorem and the uh, conclusion he reached that it was not possible to come up with a voting system that satisfied all five of his conditions. Um, I want to just like get on a soapbox for just 30 seconds here and say, I'm on board. Uh, <laughs> so I interpret Arrow's result um, differently from the way that a lot of people seem to quote it. They sort of quote it as an impossibility theorem and, and sort of summarize it to say, oh, well, there's no perfect voting system. Or, you know, every system has a flaw or a paradox of some kind. Um, and I really don't see it that way because. Kenneth Arrow chose a particular set of criteria um, to make that proof about. So the content of the proof, like the, the result of the proof, really says something about the criteria that he chose. It doesn't say something about all voting systems, right? It says this set of criteria, the five criteria or six criteria, depending on, you know, depending on how you count, are not mutually consistent. Um, and that's really all that it says. Uh, you know, and then you're, you, you know, the 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 Interesting design question is what criteria should matter to you when you're designing a voting system? I mean, in any engineering discipline, you've got a bunch of different criteria, a bunch of different desiderata that you have, and you've got to trade off how important those are, um, what value they have to you. Uh, and, you know, Kenneth Arrow found one case, one, one particular set of criteria where it was not possible to achieve uh, in the absolute um, a system that met every criterion. Uh, and so that simply says, okay, well, we need to make some trade-offs. You need to relax one of those criteria. Maybe maybe some of those criteria are not as important as, as others. Um, and of course, there are entire classes of voting systems that um, Arrow's theorem doesn't apply to. So that's that's how I like to frame it. It's it's really a theorem about the criteria that he chose. Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. And I'll also include a link to uh, an article on our site where we talk a bit more about uh, Kenneth Arrow's theorem as well as to an interview that I was fortunate enough to have with Kenneth Arrow before he passed. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but I, I think you're, you're, you're speaking well to the, to the idea of a kind of classical mindset that we've, that a lot of academics have taken towards voting methods, which is a criterion based approach, which is we, we say some set of criteria are important. And if a voting method fails it, then it's no good. Uh, and if it passes it, like, uh, uh, it's great, uh, but to pass the voting method criteria and it has to do it every single time, there can't be any failures. And so it's not saying anything really to the extent of uh, how badly a particular criterion is, is being failed. So if it messes up, like how far off does it get? And it also uh, saying nothing about the prevalence uh, or the, uh, uh, the, uh, the likelihood of a particular criterion being failed as well. 
yeah, that's that's exactly right. Um, I'll, I'll say that. <clears throat> um, so I, I actually encountered this. I was doing this work and thinking about voting systems, uh, voting methods like this, before I uh, started looking more deeply into election security, and that really broadened my perspective on elections from being these theoretical systems where you know you have these ballots and you're just trying to get a result to these messy real world, real world systems where you know, voters have to get to the polls. They need time off work to vote. Uh, they may or may not understand the ballot or the balloting system or the counting system um, equally well. Um, there are concerns like some ability that are entirely practical concerns as to how to run an election. Uh, and they, you know, those things influence things like how vulnerable is the election to um, different kinds of attack? Um, what kinds of incentives uh, do politicians have to make regulations around voting? And so, you know, as, as you step back, you sort of zoom back, there's, there's just a lot more uh, concerns that you need to take into account um, that are really significant and worth trading off against. Um, you know, one that I find particularly concerning, for instance, uh, and interesting about instant runoff is that um, it seems to um, significantly increase the number of spoiled ballots uh, because it's more complicated to mark an instant runoff ballot. And it seems that not only are there many more spoiled ballots, but the spoiled ballots are predominantly um, in regions of uh, voters of color um, or uh, voters in, in lower socioeconomic classes. Um, that's, you know, that's a huge effect, right? I mean, if you suppress the vote by 1% or 2% consistently um, for people of color, uh, that could easily swamp um, you know, many other effects that you might be concerned about. And I'll, I'll go ahead and put another article uh, in the uh, chat, uh, looking at the kind of fundamental question of what makes a voting method good. What are the particular types of qualities of a voting method that are important? Uh, and like as you mentioned, like there are a number of them, but we kind of highlight uh, some of them as well. Um, maybe go into some last minute questions before we uh, wrap up here. Someone's um, asked for a citation for the claim about spoiled ballots. Is there one linked on the page you just referenced or? Uh, no, the, the article that I referenced just looks at um, kind of the fundamental question of what makes a voting method good. I don't believe it goes into that particular uh, okay, I issue. Can, I can dig around. I have uh, I have come across that before and I can probably find the link for it. Excellent. Um, is there anything that also you'd like to share with us or, or plug uh, as, we're, as we're wrapping up here? Uh, it's been, yeah, I, I don't have any specific things to, um, to say beyond what I've, what I've conveyed. I'm again, really happy to be here and, and, um, you know, it's an honor to get to speak to all of you. Um, and, uh, I'm really, really strongly supportive of the work that CES is doing on approval voting. Um, I hope that, uh, it catches on. It, it's really, uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, I wish people could could see all of the advantages of it um, and how uh, its simplicity and um, how how cheap it is to run, um, how simple it is to migrate to uh, an approval system, how much easier it is to do that than an instant runoff system. Um, you know, uh, it would be really great if um, it were uh, more popular. And so um, I'm glad that we're talking about this and. Uh, learning about it together. Uh, well, I, I, like I mentioned before, you've got a lot of uh, uh, admirers uh, uh, among us, uh, myself included, uh, very appreciative of all the work that you've done. Um, and I see one person asking about uh, the um, uh, Discord as well. So as a, a reminder, we do have a Discord that folks are free to join on. Um, okay. I'll also share uh, uh, Kapingi's uh, website, where you can find lots more information on voting and other projects that he's doing. Uh, you can find that in the chat. Um, this is also a link to our Discord, uh, which uh, uh, Kapingi, you are, are, are welcome to uh, uh, join uh, us there, where we talk about all the campaigns that we're doing, uh, including uh, looking at places around the, uh, the Bay Area where we are, um, uh, as, uh, as well as some of the, uh, the, the wonkier stuff as well. Uh, so kind of uh, wrapping up here, uh, I want to thank uh, Ka Pingyi again uh, for uh, his time 
and being able to share this awesome work that has really uh, brought a lot of eyes and attention to voting methods and being able to illustrate ideas that are really kind of complicated and being able to make it so that they're easier for us to understand and look at really in creative ways and being able to really see uh, different aspects of what makes a voting method good uh, or bad. Uh, and your work has definitely helped there uh, quite a lot for a number of us. And there is a reason uh, why these are named after you uh, because folks appreciate it and they've been valuable. Uh, and I appreciate it too. Uh, and, uh, and also plugging the organization, the Center for Action Science. If you've liked this event and you would like to see more events uh, like this, then uh, you should uh, uh, make sure that you're subscribed uh, to us on social media. Uh, on our newsletter. And also, we are a 501c3, uh, and we would love to help you make your tax deductible contribution. Uh, or if you can't uh, deduct, uh, we would still love your contribution to, so that we can uh, be able to put these events on in the future, as well as to make sure that we are able to empower voters uh, in cities and states throughout the country so that they can use a, a voting method uh, that is able to encapsulate their values and make sure that they have a voice. So again, I want to thank everyone and especially Kapping Yi uh, for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, actually, I'm just curious, Aaron, do you want to say anything about CES's, uh, like are there current initiatives you're doing um, in particular jurisdictions to promote approval voting? Anything that's like, close to passing or? Sure. Uh, so our, our biggest wins have been in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, uh, which we are particularly proud of because that happened uh, immediately um, uh, within a year of our initial funding. Uh, we hired staff and got uh, approval voting passed in North Dakota all within a year. Uh, so we were Amazing. particularly proud of that, uh, that speed run that we had done. Uh, for democracy uh, and then uh, and uh, right after that uh, after we got initial funding uh, we saw approval voting get passed in st louis and, and to, to kind of toot our, our own horn a bit more uh, with that initial uh, win in in fargo north dakota we we went from uh, not having staff to getting a voting method implemented that had not been implemented anywhere in the country uh, ever uh, uh, to its uh, to its first, uh, uh, so we were just a, another uh, way of just highlighting how how precious that that win was for us, um, and and then as a result, being able to see these elections carry out, being able to see uh, the folks in Fargo being able to win without like a sliver of support uh, from the vote splitting that they were used to, uh, being able to see the voters in St. Louis, uh, whereas previously you had a number of candidates uh, suffer from vote splitting within the black community, being able to see, and the progressive community, and being able to see uh, those uh, uh, votes really being able to be more accurate and being able to see uh, candidate support in a much clearer light uh, without having to uh, go through all that vote splitting that, uh, that St. Louis was used to. And also, uh, being able to see like their uh, their previous uh, uh, mayor who won as a result of vote splitting. The moment that mayor found out that approval voting had passed, she's like, I'm not going to run anymore. Uh, wow. perhaps seeing the the writing on the wall that vote splitting wasn't going to allow her to uh, to come through with a, with a victory again. Uh, and we now have campaigns throughout the country. Um, uh, we have uh, over uh, 50 to 80 individual cities where folks have uh, shown interest in uh, building uh, chapters. We have a chapter system uh, for cities and states across the country, um, in particular, like looking at uh, places in Colorado, looking at Seattle, looking throughout Texas uh, and, and Utah, really all over the place. So we are really, uh, really excited uh, to, uh, to push forward. And again, uh, thanks everyone for uh, helping to bring us where we are, and we are happy to celebrate uh, with you as we move along, and are also excited to highlight the uh, uh, the other uh, 
players in the space who have helped us to get to where we are and be able to see uh, really how uh, voting methods play out and for us to have a, a better understanding of it. So, and I just use that again as an opportunity to thank uh, Kapini uh, as, as one of those individuals. Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, um, uh, sign off everyone. And again, thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Thanks for joining.